Degrees. I'm a soil health scientist here at Ward Lab and I focus on uh, soil health uh, research and development and then uh, customer support uh, and then a little bit of agronomy as well. Uh, so today what I'm going to talk about is some of the I guess long-standing work that I've done during my graduate work and a lot during my undergraduate which was heavy metals in the environment uh, because we get a lot of questions from growers about uh, heavy metals in their soils and how that affects uh, plant uptake, things like that, or how well, what can they do to re remediate the situation. So um, some of the biggest, uh, the most relevant metals that I get asked about are lead, arsenic, and cadmium. Um, so lead uh, is typically sourced from uh, leaded gasoline up until the 1960s, uh, 50s or 60s, uh, whenever it was phased out, and then, uh, but we still have some residual uh, of that in the soil, and then uh, leaded paint, uh, from old buildings whenever it rains and the paint ships off, a lot of the lead's transported. And then cadmium is typically sourced from things like zinc mining or cadmium mining directly because it's used in battery production. Uh, but we use zinc in fertilizers, um, so uh, since they're, um, uh, they share the same column on the periodic table, they have very same chemistry, so once you pull out zinc, it's just naturally enriched in cadmium. So that's one of the issues. Um, uh, lead and arsenic together though, specific to ag, has been historically used um, as a pesticide to treat uh, codling moths in orchards. So this is a, uh, it was a big, big issue using this uh, pesticide in places like Washington State, uh, the West Coast and East Coast where we have a lot of our apple production, uh, mostly because the soil acts as a sponge uh, and will soak up pretty much anything you put in it, um, especially heavy metals. And they did this from about 1900 to the 1960s when it was phased out and replaced by DDT, which is uh, another problem today. Um, but we ended up with concentrations of about 1,200 uh, ppm lead and then about uh, 300 to 400, uh, sometimes 700 uh, ppm of arsenic. And a lot of that land was sold for development, and so we have many, many issues with this, or they're still growing things on them. So we have to look to see uh, how to keep that arsenic and lead in the soil, or remove it altogether and not in the plants uh, and the foods that we uh, end up eating that are grown on those soils. So uh, why are these a problem? So metals are uh, carcinogenic, they're, they're cancer causing for the most part, but one of the issues with lead is that it impairs child brain development. So uh, keeping children away from lead exposure is uh, a grave concern because uh, they will be affected for the rest of their lives if they have um, uh, physiological impairments from lead consumption. Um, and arsenic and cadmium both cause cancer. So arsenic is very um, well known for causing skin cancers because it will degrade the keratins in your skin. Um, and then uh, cadmium will actually replace, uh, besides uh, renal failure, which is the big cancer that it causes, uh, kidney cancer, um, it will actually replace cal calcium in your bones. And so uh, it can uh, serve the place of calcium, but not the function of calcium. So then the bones will eventually uh, bend uh, and lose their, their support. So it's a huge issue with that. That's usually in places that have uh, high amounts of cadmium in the soil, so typically other regions. So for um, the lead exposure risks in the environment, the EPA has uh, given us guidelines for um, heavy metals in soils, uh, especially uh, agricultural soils. They have one for residential and then one for agriculture, the, the limits for these. Um, they're, they're much lower for agricultural soils, naturally because we grow food on these soils and we don't want to eat metals. So uh, for lead, it's about 200 ppm in ag soils. Arsenic is about 0.11 ppm, and then cadmium is 0.48, so it's quite low. And again, for res residential soils, they're much, much higher. I think for lead, it's about 400 if you gives you an idea, mostly because no one's expected to eat the soil or really farm on those soils. Um, but you know, people grow gardens in their backyards, so we still get questions about this quite a bit. Uh, some of the uh, ways that the metals actually become available is uh, soil disturbance is probably the main way. So tillage or development, um, things like that, uh, industrial activity. Um, and rainwater, so raining event, rain events and uh, wind events, wind will pick up the heavy metals and they'll uh, increase their uh, mobility in the environment and their ability to be taken up by plants. Um, and then with dust carried uh, heavy metals, uh, you ex we get exposed to that through inhalation, which is probably one of the worst ways to get heavy metals into your system, mostly because of the surface area of your lungs. Everything you breathe in is considered to be 100% bioavailable and uh, you know, assimilated into your, 
your physiology. So it's, it's best to not breathe in heavy metals. So the uh, uptake of heavy metals by plants is very crop specific and very metal specific. So uh, to give you an idea, so for cadmium, uh, some of the crops that are, uh, are, that are known to take up uh, cadmium are lettuce, spinach, celery, cabbage, and rice. Um, for lead, uh, lead's very, uh, it's a very heavy, or I guess a very large uh, atom, so only a few crops can actually take it up. So kale, rye grass, and celery. Uh, there's probably a few other ones, but those are the main food crops. Uh, then arsenic, um, brown rice, uh, uh, long grain dark rice, any rice with the, the bran, the dark bran on it, uh, will take up arsenic and it accumulates in that bran. Uh, and then rye grass and lentils are known to take up arsenic as well. Um, uh, rice also takes up a lot of these, mostly because it's a submerged crop and a lot of things come into solution in that sort of submerged aquatic system and the rice will just suck it up and put it right into the grain. So uh, this is a huge issue in developing regions where they eat rice about four to five times a day. Heavy metals in the soils can also uh, impair the uh, crop yield and development, but those have to be uh, quite high concentrations to do that. Um, but uh, it, usually um, if you are trying to diagnose issues in your crop um, and you've never done soil testing uh, and you've sort of ruled everything else out, you might need to get a, a heavy metal sweep analysis of your soils just to see what it, what's in there. That's usually a, a worst case scenario. It's also good to do that if you're, uh, if you're, if you uh, encounter a brand new field that you're working with, uh, or even a new home, uh, you know, uh, if you're curious, what, if you wanna do some gardening in your backyard, so just to be safe, especially if in areas where you know that there has been sort of historic industrial activity or agricultural work that's been converted to uh, residential areas. So that's a really good thing to check out. There's a few other tests that we use um, that can actually, uh, uh, what their, their function is to sort of mimic uh, sort of uh, physiological systems either in plants or humans. So uh, there's one that mimics uh, your gut uh, uh, that they apply to a lot of these metals to see how much is actually incorporated. Um, the EPA does some of these tests. And there's some that we can actually do in a lab, even an ag testing lab. So we can use the, the, the micronutrient analysis, uh, which acts as a plant chelator. Um, which will gives us an idea about the, the, the plant available fraction. We can also use um, uh, ammonium acetate, uh, which is what we use for, to determine your exchangeable nutrients, uh, so calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium. That also works as, a, as a, a plant available indicator of heavy metals, and it's often used for that purpose. Uh, you can also do a total digest, which is what a lot of facilities do, um, which will give you a, a full uh, analysis of uh, the, the total amounts in your soil. Um, it's a, Good to have that idea if you expect the concentrations to be quite high. So uh, the, the most direct question we get, or, or I guess I get, um, especially with doing this work, is uh, how do I fix it? So uh, how do we get it out of our soil? Uh, the most direct way to um, remediate heavy metals in the soil is to just remove them. So topsoil removal and replacement, it really just depends on the concentration and the metal. Like I said, not, not everything in the soil is available for human or plant uptake. Uh, all, it depends on the metal and the concentration and the form it's in in the soil. Uh, but if the concentration is quite high, uh, especially in residential areas, usually the city will try to find a way to remove it altogether and replace it with fresh topsoil, fresh clean topsoil. Um, there's a few other ways um, to actually uh, take care of this. So if you're if you are near like a, a an untouched meadow or pasture, and you know that there's heavy metals in there. Just don't do anything with it. That's one option. Uh, you know, if you do have that option, um, and uh, so don't graze it um, because cattle can actually eat the grasses that are pr produced on there, uh, and don't farm anything on it uh, or till the soil. Don't disturb it or touch it uh, if you have that option. Now, uh, a lot of people have uh, a lot of land because they want to farm uh, or graze cattle or something like that. So, uh, how do you rem remediate those soils or reduce the toxicity of those metals? Uh, there's a few amendments you can actually apply that have it historically been applied for a lot of these metals. So some of these amendments that are used for um, soil remediation uh, in contaminated soils, uh, one of the most well-known ones is iron, iron oxide. So uh, especially for arsenic. Uh, iron actually, uh, if you think about it, uh, a lot of the, the planet is iron. Uh, and so a lot of the, the metals on our planet have a historic relationship with iron, you can say in a way, chemically speaking. Um, but we use iron, uh, we sort of exploit that relationship and apply it to help bind up and tie up some of these metals so that plants and animals won't, won't eat them or consume them um, or take them up. So 
uh, if you apply ferrous sulfate, um, which is a lot of what we apply for reducing, uh, sometimes reducing the pH of soil, but also for iron availability issues, um, uh, iron chlorosis issues, we typically apply ferrous sulfate, uh, we broadcast that. About a half a percent by weight, uh, along with a half a percent by weight of lime, is, uh, has been shown to be a really good way to remediate arsenic in soils. So that's a kind of a cheap, easy way to do it. Uh, you would need to test it out with some plants to see what's actually being taken up, have a test plot, and then a, sort of a, con a control and a test plot to see what the differences actually are. Uh, so don't take it with a grain of salt. Um, you have to actually determine some of this for yourself and uh, know the risks associated with taking that approach. That's, that's, you have to be quite clear about that um, because it's not 100% curing the problem. You're just sort of changing the form of the soil. Uh, Lime itself has actually been used to remediate heavy metals in soils because you uh, form these insoluble carbonate precipitates. So in rice paddies, they've applied it for cadmium contamination. Some people apply it for lead. Um, it's not typically applied for arsenic, though. But if you raise the pH, you'll, you'll typically change the form. You'll precipitate things out, and they're insoluble and not available for plant uptake. So that is also a very cheap option that people typically do in ag already. Sometimes there's organic amendments that we can use to uh, reduce the availability and mobility and toxicity of some of these metals. So a very popular one recently has been biochar, which is just charred biomass. Uh, this is actually a pretty good option because a lot of people, um, unless you leave the residues on your crop, you typically have a lot of leftover residue and so people will take that. Uh, you have to have a specific setup so you're not you know, ashing the material, you're just charring it a little bit and you form these, uh, this really stable carbon um, uh, sort, of, sort of graphite material um, that you can apply and uh, it binds quite readily to heavy metals, uh, a range of heavy metals, which is pretty good. You, so you can also mix that with some of the ferrous sulfate and apply it and it forms, a, I would say, an even more stable complex because it not only gets um, some of the metals that um, it's known to tie up, but some of the metals that it's not really known to tie up that typically the iron can get. Uh, so you form this sort of uh, whole, it's like a holistic approach to reducing the availability of heavy metals in your soil. Uh, you can apply things like compost, uh, but it's only specific to metals like uh, cadmium or lead, and it has to be a very stable compost, so very well developed, not a young compost because it's, uh, there's a lot of um, dissolved carbon that comes off the compost that can actually uh, tie up the uh, lead and cadmium and make it more available for plant uptake or increase its mobility in the environment. So just keep that in mind. You have to kind of know uh, the, the remedy for some of these uh, metals in the environment. You're not applying something that's going to increase the availability. Um, one example is uh, the application of phosphate for lead. It's been typically applied it'll, uh, for lead remediation because it'll form insoluble lead phosphate precipitates. Unfortunately, phosphate and uh, Phosphorus and arsenic are uh, chemical analogs in the periodic table, so uh, they have very similar chemistries. Uh, we use phosphorus for agriculture, so if you apply phosphorus, um, it typically will release arsenic from exchange sites uh, since they compete, uh, and so you'll increase the availability of arsenic. So uh, it's kind of interesting. Chemically, it's very interesting. Um, it's very difficult if you have a very multi-contaminated multi system uh, what you should apply and how you should um, approach some of these um, issues. But you can always consult uh, one of us here at Ward Lab or any uh, soil scientist who has experience in heavy, metal, uh, heavy metals and remediation in the environment. Uh, and hopefully this has been pretty useful for you.